Welcome, welcome. This is an important, juicy turkey episode of Six Rotations here on Thanksgiving week, and maybe one of the best weeks of college women's volleyball scheduling wise coming up. We can't wait to bring you all the action. Line it all up. Fill your Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday with volleyball mania. As always, we're brought to you by SNA Sports, better equipment for a better game. He's Mick Haley. I'm Daniel Gilman. We've got a great guest at the end of this episode as the freshman setter in Lincoln, Nebraska. Bergen Riley joins us. Mick, we've been trying to get Bergen all year. Her schedule's been <laughs> packed, and I don't think we could have found a better week to line up this interview with such a poised, mature freshman coming into Madison on Friday afternoon. Let's start there. Wisconsin upset by Purdue. Nebraska keeps on rolling. They're undefeated. They win the Big Ten Conference for the first time since 2017. We've got to give our flowers to the Huskers and their faithful. Yeah, they did a great job. And uh, you know, Riley was uh, quite interesting. She was pretty laid back, uh, very comfortable in her own skin. And uh, you don't expect that from a freshman setter, but... Uh, I think that's why they're successful. I'll tell you what reminded me a lot of our chat with Emma Grome last year, right? The freshman yeah. Lexington. Meanwhile, Kentucky controls their own destiny. They've got a great weekend ahead. Is There's a lot we've got to cover. We've got the automatic qualifiers. There's already 22 teams that have punched their spot into the field of 64, only 10 AQs left. Meanwhile, the ACC, another team that doesn't have a tournament, is about to get decided as Florida State sits one win away. Yes, Florida State, not Pittsburgh, not Louisville, not Georgia Tech, because there was pandemonium in the ACC, Mick. Pittsburgh reverse sweeps Louisville, 17-15 in the fifth. Anna DeBeer goes into the net on match point in front of a, a record crowd, 8,865 to see DeBeer go for 29 kills, hitting over 400. Charity Looper added 24, but it was our guest in Olivia Babcock who goes 23 and 12. Stafford adds 21 kills. And now, Mick, you and I were on the call all weekend long in Corpus Christi to see the Southland Conference get decided. So we weren't able to watch a lot of the volleyball, but at least stats-wise, this Pittsburgh team just put themselves into the top four pretty confidently. They seem to... Uh like to do the reverse sweep that uh, seems to be their deal they they pull this off more often than any, any other team that we've watched all year um do you, do you have any feeling of why why that works for them you know what, Mick? I really just think it comes down to winning the third set, right? And I think Dan Fisher's got his team in a mentality where it's like, hey, if you win the third set, no matter what happens in the rest of this match, whether you win the first or second, if you could win the third set, you take control of this match, right? We talk about this all the time. There's only two sports in all of the world that work like this, and it's tennis and volleyball, where you can mentally completely reset at the beginning of each set, Mick. And I think we saw it as well with Purdue, because Wisconsin came out so strong in that fourth set, forced the fifth. You know, we saw Devin Robinson coming up big. She had zero kills at one point with six errors, picked up eight or nine kills in the fourth and fifth set. Sarah Franklin added 28, but no Anna Smrek. So, uh, you know, Julia Orgel moves from uh, Libero to the front row. Eva Hudson goes 30 kills. I mean, Eva Hudson puts Purdue right into the picture for another national contending season for Coach Shondell. Yeah, we've been talking about Hudson for a long time, though. And and this is the first time that she's really put the team on her back and, and taken them forward. And this is the kind of play that we think that uh, probably she can do for the next two years, actually. Well, we're just days away from Selection Sunday. We've also got the media uh, poll for the Volleyball Magazine we'll talk about in a little bit. And of course, let's go top five right now. AVCA Terraflex top five rankings, Mick. And I'm curious what you think, because there's a lot of shakeup. And very evidently, there is no Louisville here in the top five as Nebraska gets all 64 first place votes. Stanford avoids an upset from UCLA wins in five and wins the Pac-12 conference behind Kipps 21 kills. Ellie Rubin goes for 18 and then Stanford went and beat USC without uh, Skylar Fields on Sunday. So Stanford two, Pitt moves from seven to three and then Texas who won their seventh straight big 12 title with the win over Iowa state. They swept UCF as well. They'll sit in front of Wisconsin as the Badgers are all of a sudden Mick, looking on the outside and maybe needing a win on Friday to secure a top four seed. 
Yeah, I, th I think that uh, that's pretty accurate, Daniel. But uh, why the coaches penalized Louisville for a five set loss with Pitt uh, that badly? Pitt goes from seven to three, but they take Louisville, who was fourth, and put them seventh. I would think Louisville would stay at four, Texas at five, or Wisconsin at five, and Texas at six. Uh, it's interesting that the uh, KPI ratings uh, are pretty much the way we're talking, not not the way the coaches put them out. Yeah, it certainly is a surprise. But at the end of the day, these polls just don't quite matter when it comes to the committee <laughs> rankings. So I think, you know, Louisville fans just realize, hey, you've got Georgia Tech at home on Wednesday. If you win that match you're most likely going to host, in my opinion. I just can't see them putting Texas over Louisville if Louisville finishes the season with a top 10, top 15 win. But you never know, because Texas, at the end of the day, is Texas and seemingly gets a little bit of a nod, of course, as defending champions. Meanwhile, Miami plays Pittsburgh on Wednesday, and Florida State can win the ACC if they beat Salima Rockwell and Notre Dame this upcoming week, which is crazy. It would be a tie between Pitt and FSU. They only played once. And as we know uh, from two weeks ago, Florida State did win that meeting. Um, you know, obviously we've got Wisconsin, Nebraska on Friday. Nebraska swept Michigan, swept Iowa. Do you think they're going to get stopped? I I'm really not seeing it. It would it would take a lot, you know, to to really slow down this machine. The reason that Wisconsin is rated lower uh, in a lot of the polls that deal with statistics is their first four week schedule of the season. They've lost two in a row in the last three weeks, or not two in a row, but they've lost two in the last three weeks. That shows some doubt that they've had an injury. Now they're 100%. So going in against Nebraska, Nebraska playing them at Wisconsin's home, if Nebraska wins, you're really going to give some pats on the back to Nebraska. But the conventional thinking is Wisconsin wins this and moves back into the top four. I mean, that's, that's my conventional thinking, at least. Um, let's take a look at the rest of our poll here. And so with that, we can see the conglomeration of the SEC, right? In the 8, 9, 10 spot with Tennessee, <laughs> Arkansas, Kentucky. You know, some might argue that Kentucky maybe deserves to be a little bit higher than that. They have now won 14 matches in a row. But my answer to them is, well, it'll all be figured out on the hard court. Arkansas plays Kentucky on Wednesday. Wednesday may be the single most exciting day of the season, at least a weekday, a non-weekend of this entire year with Georgia Tech, Louisville, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Arizona State, Washington State. As Washington State sits at 11, and Arizona State, who lost to Oregon in four, fell in their first home loss of the season for the Sun Devils, who bounced back to beat Oregon State. You know, I'm, I'm very interested to watch that one on Wednesday. We also have the Apple Cup, which is Washington State, Washington on Friday. But Mick, Kentucky will play Arkansas. Kentucky will play Florida. Arkansas will play Auburn. Yeah. I think it's all going to get worked out here in the eight through 10. The team that gets to kind of sit back a little bit is Tennessee because they don't have the, the hardest finish to their schedule. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think uh, we get Arkansas gets a chance to really prove themselves this weekend. Kentucky gets a chance to take charge of the whole conference. Florida needs to beat Kentucky to prove that they're worthy of a higher seed than what they're being scheduled right now. So that is really worth watching. I, I love that. I think uh, USC-UCLA is a match that could really help you UCLA. If UCLA beats USC, who's coming in at a pretty high ranking right now, uh, UCLA could grab a bid here just by coming on late. They played Stanford to five before. So I don't know what uh, Alfie Raff's got going out there, but he's got the Bruins playing. Yeah, and one thing that I'm going to probably avoid doing because this is our final show before the selection Sunday, I'm just going to let all of you guys try to sort out this RPI stuff, right? The last few years, I've done my best job of being a bracketologist, and it just wasn't wasn't fun. It didn't go well. 
It's just one of those things that, hey, you guys can try to figure out what you think in terms of the bubble teams. I have no idea. I'm just going to give you some facts here. And some of the facts are Kansas, in my mind, have just solidified their spot as a top 16 seed. They swept Baylor. They upset BYU in four sets. And Mick, I watched the end of that BYU match. BYU ran out of challenges. They couldn't challenge a close touch call at the end of the fourth set. Kansas avoids... um, you know, any, any upsets this season, they really didn't get, you know, the crazy cradle robbing scenario that we saw with Kansas state because Kansas beat them in five. Meanwhile, Iowa state upset Houston. The big 12 is looking very, very dangerous because of that middle area where if Kansas state can get in, you know, Houston's talented. Obviously we're talking about BYU having to go on the road now because they might not be a top 16 team. I think we are going to see five to seven seeds of uh, eliminated before we get to the second weekend. Oh, I think, I think for sure that's a possibility. That's a good call on your part. But I tell you what, I, I feel like the way this is going and that that group of mid teams from like 14 to 35, the first and second rounds are going to be like the basketball tournament. Yeah. I mean, there are going to be a ton of upsets, as you predicted, but, but you don't know where they're coming. You've got 16 sites and you don't want to miss that. So I'm, I'm thinking Thursday, Friday and Saturday, you're watching all day long. You You want to see what's happening. Oh, there's no doubt about it. My schedule has been wiped clean for the opening weekend of December. I can't wait. You know, you've got teams like Creighton and Dayton and Western Kentucky that are just steamrolling their opponents. Dayton's won 26 in a row. Western Kentucky avoids an upset against UTEP over the weekend. They've won 24 in a row. Florida State, obviously we talked about them. They avoided an upset against North Carolina. They are looking like they're going to win the ACC and be a two seed in one of these regions. You know, Houston, USC, Baylor, such talented teams. Florida even pushes Arkansas to five. That is a talented loss. You talk about a loss with a win involved. That might be the case for my Gators. They're going to finish off their year against Kentucky on Saturday. Kentucky beat Texas A&M and Missouri. They've got a juggernaut of a finish to try to win the SEC against Arkansas and Florida. And a couple other notes here, Penn State beat Michigan State and Northwestern. They'll finish up with Ohio State. And I'm very curious, Mick, you've got a couple teams on that outside there. You see Santa Barbara won the regular season for the Big West. That might be a two-bid conference if a team like Hawaii comes in and wins the Big West tournament. And we look at the same thing with the Big East, right? Marquette is certainly found themselves in. And Mick, how about the Sun Belt? How many teams do you think are going to make it? Coastal Carolina wins the Sun Belt again, beats JMU behind the freshman Jalen Stout. Did you see this line, Mick? 28 assists for the 5-2 offense. She went 22-0-36 with 16 digs, her 14th triple-double of the season. Just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it, that that whole conference. Listen, if the committee goes strictly by KPI RPI, they get four teams in the tournament. Believe that because the lowest of those four teams is at forty-five, and uh, there are three of them below forty. So I'd say that that conference gets at least three. They deserve four. Let's see what the committee does. All right, it's rapid fire time here, Mick. Are you guys ready to get an idea of who our automatic qualifiers are? I'm going to go right through the list. We're going to talk about a few standouts, and then I'll try to bang out a few more. You know, Long Island University, LIU clinched their first spot since 2017. UMBC beats Binghamton to win the America East. Talked about Southeastern. They won their 22nd straight match of the season. Back to the tournament beating Coastal, or excuse me, beating Corpus Christi as Coastal Carolina wins as well. All right, here we go. Florida Gulf Coast, High Point, SMU, Fairfield. How about Wofford? Wofford upsets the Citadel. It's been a year, a year of upsets. And how about that? The Citadel were 20-0 and at one point, and now Wofford's going to work their way into the tournament. Yeah, and, and Citadel was one of those teams that I, I thought could upset somebody in the first round because they hit the ball. I feel like that about Southeastern. I feel like that about Western Michigan. But Western Michigan's not in yet because they have to play their final match today. Yep, yep. There are a couple teams, same with, uh, you know, UNI, who had a perfect regular season in the MVC. 
you know, they won for their 21st time in program history. They'll play their semis and finals this week, Tuesday and Wednesday. How about a few more? Wright State, Delaware, Yale, welcome to the tournament, Coppin State, Jackson State, and Colgate, and then Grand Canyon University to round out the list. There's 22 teams that have clinched their spot. Of course, you've got conferences like the SEC and the ACC and the Big East, where we already know that they are going to have multiple bids. You know, the Missouri Valley, the Ohio Valley, the MAC up for grabs, Big West, Big Sky, Mountain West and Summit are the final teams that we are still waiting to fill our field of 32 confirmed, 32 at large. And then, Mick, I am I, I'm almost just excited to see what the NIVC field is going to look like, whether teams like San Diego, Ohio State, Indiana are willing to accept bids and really work on their team and try to grow some of these youngsters because a team like USD – just only has one returner from last year in Blackwell. That's a chance for, you know, Coach Petri to really grow some of these youth. I don't know. What's your opinion on the NIVC here and whether, you know, you think coaches should start to get more push to join? I really think that the the teams that don't make the tournament are good this year. There are so many good teams. If they don't go to this tournament, I really feel they're missing an opportunity. And the tournament misses an opportunity by not having them. I mean, there, there are just so many good teams out there, and especially in these one-team conferences, when the, the leading team got upset, they really want to go to this tournament because this is a chance to really prove themselves and build for next year. So I'm hoping that athletic directors will start supporting this a lot more, sending their teams every time they're, they're ready because it's going to be a tough win. Well, let me list a few more teams. Like, how exciting would this field of the NIVC be, right? You already talk about those teams I just mentioned, right? San Diego and, and Ohio State and Indiana. What about Illinois and Washington and, you know, TCU or how about Georgia? We saw how good Georgia can be. Kansas State, for example, might be on the outside looking in. Same with uh you know, Long Beach State or Hawaii, you know, Colorado, you know, these are some teams that I really think would fill a very, very talented field. You know, UCF, you know, they, they made some noise. They started their season undefeated this year. I, I just am imploring some of these coaches, if you are watching, to just consider it because if you can convince five or six of your friends that are coaches of top programs that are just not good enough this year or just maybe scheduled a little bit too tough in the case of Ohio State, why not rally the troops and host? You can host all the way to the championship if you're a top team, right? Like let's say Indiana decides to join the NIVC, Mick. They can have matches in Wilkinson Hall. I think, I believe that's what it's called. Brand new facilities. They can have fans coming to matches every single weekend for the next couple of weeks going into the final four where the host is still going to host the final four and the championship for the NIVC. I think it's a really special experience. And of course we saw what Georgia Tech could do three years ago and then Boston College last year and Drake and we're just starting to see a movement here in the NIVC and now I'll get off my platform well a couple of good things for coaches I mean there's two ways to look at that tournament if you know you're losing some uh, seniors and you want to get your next year setter some reps right away in a tournament with all your hitters and everybody being well trained at the time you could start a new setter in that tournament you could develop some things there you could play a, a freshman outside you could start a new middle. Uh, there are several ways you could use it as a development tournament as well as a competitive uh, event too. So I, I like it for a number of reasons and every team will have a different reason to get into that tournament and should certainly consider spending the money to do that. And hosting is really good. I mean, if you can get, like you said, hosting, Indiana's got that beautiful new facility. They have good crowds this year. According to Dave Shondell, they're as tough as they've ever been in the Big Ten. I think Illinois um, as well. Yeah, very talented team. You know, why not go to that tournament and, and have your kids finish on an upswing and get ready for the spring, and then you're ready to go the next year and challenge for the conference championship. Yep. Two notes here. Um, I do want to give some love to Kylie Murr, who came on our show in the offseason. She became just the second Big Ten player ever to record 2,300 digs. That is an unbelievable feat. And I can't wait to see if Minnesota can work their way into the bubble. I believe they will. And and hopefully, you know, maybe make some noise here with, with Coach Keegan Cook. Meanwhile, there was a little bit of buzz on social media over the weekend 
with uh, with Coach Dave Shondell putting together a Twitter thread that really talked about how good the Big Ten was, how they had eight or nine teams as good as usual, but the coaches mismanaged the RPI system. Quote, our coaches need to discuss what transpired this season to assure that every Big Ten team that is tournament worthy has the RPI under 45. What other league teams do in non-com play have significant impact on all others. This may just be an anomaly, but conversations must be had. I'm, I'm curious to see how that translates over, you know, uh, Coach Thomas with Illinois answered that question and said, I agree with Dave with a caveat. RPI should not be the leading metric for bids. It doesn't consider important factors. The job of the committee is to consider numbers, but to get the best 64 teams in the playoff. You know, there's a conversation to be had that's two different topics, too. Dave's talking about one thing. Chris is talking about another thing. I do think coaches should be in communication before the season to try to coordinate their schedules best. You know, there's one other factor. The Big, Big Ten Network is doing such a good job in their production of the matches that it almost seems like the Big Ten is playing better, but the numbers don't say that, okay? So uh, it's really interesting uh, how you see the matches on TV. Some some people are using four cameras. Big Ten's got six or eight cameras out there. You get, you get interviews. You get all kinds of things. The production is so good that people just – obviously think it's better than what what they're seeing in other productions but i don't believe that i i think the big 10 is down uh they're playing hard there's no question about that but the other conferences are really good this year too all right well the next time we talk to you we will have a field of 64 to discuss i cannot wait to break down the bracket talk about where our upset picks might lie really lie down and watch nothing but volleyball here for the next four weeks. Make sure to grab your tickets to Tampa. There are still tickets available in the secondary market, the final four, and the championship match. Remember, it's Thursday and Sunday, Sunday at 3 o'clock Eastern on ABC will be the final. So make sure to rearrange your flights if you forgot to and you have a Sunday morning flight like I did. <laughs> I pushed it to Monday morning. We are all set. Can't wait to cover all the action. Now let's throw it over to ourselves, catching up with what is sure to be an All-American setter in Bergen Riley with Nebraska. Joined now by the freshman setter out in Lincoln, Bergen Riley. Bergen, thanks so much for joining us. I, I, I just want to jump into things here. If you could just kind of walk us through and what some of the biggest learning lessons you've had here in this first year. Yeah, so there's been a lot of learning lessons. College is a whole different game from high school and from club. And um, the biggest reason for that is the speed of the game. And so especially as a setter, I've just kind of been learning how to keep up with that speed and um, do everything that I can to make my team successful with the speed of the game. So I want to take things back. And so for fans that aren't quite familiar, Bergen grew up in South Dakota. Uh, when did things start to kind of speed up for you? When did schools start to reach out? When did everything get real for you? At what age? Um, it was probably my freshman year. Um, well, end of eighth grade was when people kind of started to actually reach out and call. Um, but then end of my eighth grade year was when the recruiting rules changed to not being able to talk till after your sophomore year. And so I had a couple phone calls end of my eighth grade year, just kind of getting to know coaches, but nothing was too deep at that point. And I didn't really know how serious these calls were because I still was in eighth grade. Um, but then my freshman club season, I kind of had a lot of eyes on me at tournaments, had a lot of coaches watching. And that was kind of when I realized that um, volleyball could take me somewhere and I could have a lot of opportunities with volleyball. And if you can kind of go back and talk to ninth grade Bergen, what, what are some pieces of advice you would give, especially for those that are watching right now that might be in ninth grade, tenth grade, that are curious about the journey and, and maybe one thing you could do differently? Yeah, I mean, it was something that my sister always told me um, was just to trust your gut. And she was two years older than me and um, she didn't quite go through the recruiting process I went through, but I know that my ninth grade and 10th grade self stressed a lot about colleges and recruiting and going on calls and responding to emails and everything. And um, it definitely can be a stressful process because it's a big decision in your life. But I would just tell myself to trust myself and trust my gut and just know that you're going to end up at the right place, whether it's a long process, not a long process, whatever it is, everyone's process is a little different. And um, it'll all work out in the end. 
I want to give a couple uh, rapid fire questions here. Obviously, the uh, the atmosphere at Devaney is is unrivaled. But if you were to take that apart, where have been a few of your favorite places to play this season? Um, I don't know if this counts, but Memorial Stadium, obviously. Um, but then I've had a lot of fun at Purdue and Penn State. Those have both been really great environments. All right. And then you get UW Fieldhouse this coming weekend. I do want to ask you, what was the toughest thing from a setter? And I know Mick's going to dive into some setter stuff playing outside. I don't know if that's something you've ever done before. But what was the the most difficulty you had with the setting perspective? Yeah, the biggest the biggest thing was the wind. And we honestly got so lucky with the night we had. There was hardly any wind, but even just a little gust was huge on the ball. And so um we were really just focusing on the basics. Like I wasn't trying to do anything special. I wasn't trying to make the fancy set. I was really just like on one side of the court, we could really only go outside or quick. And then on the other side, we could really only go right side or quick because if we went the other way, it was going into the wind. And so the ball would just spiral and just die inside. And so that was kind of an adjustment we had to make on the fly, just how the wind was moving. But um, so yeah, the wind made it a little tough, but um, we were all very gracious with each other. We knew that this was not the ideal environment, but um, it was just so cool to be able to play in front of that many people. And if I had to deal with a little wind, I was okay with that. Go ahead, Mick. Bergen, you uh, have come into the college scene and been really, really good. Uh, what's your comfort level with the hitters? Who's the easiest to set? I have actually gotten very lucky and I really trust and I've said this before but I trust every single one of my hitters to get a kill in a big moment and I think that that's something a lot of setters can't say and I'm sure a lot will say it but I truly do mean it and so um, I've gotten really lucky I feel super comfortable setting all of my hitters and we have just a really great relationship since I have been here since January um, we've had time to build those connections and so that's been huge for us and just our connection out there on the court. So let me be more specific. What's your toughest set? Ooh, um, <laughs> honestly, just kind of depends on the game. Uh, oh yeah, like, sure. There's some games where my back sets are just flowing, or some games where my outside sets are flowing. But um, I would say this set that is consistently like you have to be pretty accurate with is the B set or the gap, the thirty-one, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. Um. And even that we've got our connection down at the middle is pretty good, but that's something that it's got to be pretty accurate because it is so fast. So I would say that's probably the one that I have to work on the most. Well, I think you've hit it right on the head. I've watched you all season and you've got to be very good with that set and the middles yeah. now drive hard to get up there to get it. So uh, keep yeah. it up. I, I, Thank I, you. I, I've loved, loved watching you this season. You've handled everything uh, wonderfully. Go get them in the playoffs. Thank you so much. All right, Bergen, who did you grow up kind of idolizing, whether it be set or any other position? Yeah, um, someone that I always kind of watched and had my eye on was Lauren Carlini. And I do think that we have very different personalities, but she was just kind of someone that she was a winner. She wanted to win. And I think that I've kind of learned to be that too, just throughout my club and high school careers. Like, I absolutely hate to lose. And so that's kind of turned into our mentality for our entire team this year is just whatever happens, we're not going to lose and we're going to win in the ugly. We're going to win in the pretty. We're going to do all of it. But whatever happens at the end of the night, we just refuse to lose. And so that's kind of something that I took away from her, just even though we are so different personality wise, I think that was a big thing that I took away from Lauren. All right. And then obviously, you know, a lot of people know this, the media and the fan attention in Lincoln is unlike any other college town, especially for volleyball. Can you think of one or two, you know, funny moments or just like quirky experiences that you've had here in this first year, whether it be a question from a media member or a request or something that someone's yelled out or anything that just made you think like, wow, this is, this is a lot. Yeah. Um, so just a few weeks ago, me, Ali and Lexi were all at a women's basketball game and um we were just walking in and immediately at the top of the escalators there were people waiting for pictures of us and so that was just kind of like an eye-opening like did people know we were coming or like were, are we really that big of a deal and then 
it probably took us the entire first quarter to even get to our seats because people just kept coming up and asking for pictures. And then we went to our seats and then there was a whole line all the way up the gym. Um, so that was really, really cool to see just like we all know that volleyball is big here and there's a lot of girls that have their little girls that have their eyes on us but that was cool because it was just like a constant stream of people and it took us the entire first half before security came up and was like hey like we're gonna take you guys down like they're kind of getting in the way of the game but um so yeah that was one and then another one that came to mind right away was me harper Andy and Lainey I think we were all just on scooters downtown we were just like going to get ice cream just having fun in the summer and there was a little I don't know what you call them have you seen the things where there's a bunch of people like sitting on a little cart and they like cycle it yeah so there were a bunch of people on those and they saw us and they're like oh my gosh that's the Nebraska volleyball team and we were like how did you even notice us like we were just scootering by like not in Nebraska gear or anything. So that was really funny. And just, it really just shows that Lincoln is all about volleyball and Nebraska really does have a huge love for volleyball. Yeah. I got to see it last year. I did uh, the fan experience at Omaha in the final four with, it was, it was with Lauren Stiverance and she, she, everywhere she went, no matter what she was getting off the podium, there was someone coming up to her and she was kind of giving me a little bit of, of advice of how to deal with that. When you got there, were there veterans like Lexi or did, did John Cook bring in any of the former players to just kind of like walk you guys through, especially with such a big group of freshmen starting freshmen too, just to kind of ease you in there in terms of uh, ex- expectations or what to do. Yeah, the veterans were huge for us. They really just walked us through it. They were very calm for us when it seemed to get a little like tense for the freshmen. But um, so, yeah, they were always there for us. They kind of would front load us and be like, hey, there's going to be these people like you can say you'll sign, but no pictures or whatever it was like. There were just kind of like set rules that we would make before we went out there just to make sure that we all got done what we needed to get done. And then like, but we could also be good role models and go and talk to our fans because we know that we wouldn't be where we are without our fans. Perfect. Thank you so much. Any more from you, Mick? No, great. I, I'm just uh, wowed by the uh, the presence of a uh, freshman setter coming in and running the maybe the best offense in the country right now. So uh, Bergen, go get them. Uh, Thank you. Really excited to watch you finish here. And uh, you're, you're a very nice interview. You're calm. And uh, uh, I'm sure your teammates are very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. All right, here's the go. I'll, I'll leave you on this one. We do ask a lot of the back row players this. This was a question we asked a lot last year. Who was okay. the hardest swing that you've had to dig this season? Ooh. Um, I honestly think there was one of Kendall Kipps that came off my arms and that one, that one hurt a little bit. <laughs> Fantastic. Good luck on Friday in Wisconsin. Thank Try you. to block out all that noise. Yeah. Thank you guys. Absolutely. She's Bergen. Bye-bye. I'm Daniel. This is six rotations.